Welcome to English Central's EduGeek webinar series, webinar number six, the Anti-Grammar Grammar Book. Can, uh, hopefully everybody can see this great picture, which I absolutely love, as to why anti-grammar grammar, what's with the title? So do you think these people are screaming, singing, or yawning? I would say they're probably not screaming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to say yawning. <laughs> yes. Okay, I think so too. Did anybody type in the question box for that answer at all? No. No, no screaming. <laughs> They're okay. yawning on their own. <laughs> They're yawning. You know, it's funny how I mean yawns are incredibly contagious. I must say, every time I look at this picture, I have to kind of stifle one myself. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Really bad. But um, we could also say that these are all people who haven't taught or who have been teaching advanced learners without using the anti-grammar grammar book. Mm. Mm, okay, so the anti-grammar idea comes from an effort to dispel the idea that teaching or learning grammar has to be dull and boring, which it does not. Um, and often the reason that grammar is a little dull, uh, well, there's two main reasons. The first main reason is there's too much work on form practice, so just you know that kind of uh, restricted written mechanical practicing the accuracy of the auxiliary verb, then the main verb, or how it's conjugated. Um, a lot of books, uh, course books, and also grammar resource books um, and practice books kind of overemphasize that. And the other thing is uh, an over-reliance on uh, PPP framework of, of teaching grammar. And PPP, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with it, is present, uh, Produce practice. practice. I was going to say it wrong. I just always call it PPP. <laughs> Present, practice, produce. That's right. There you go. <laughs> All right. And the PPP framework is it's a framework based on the deductive approach to teaching and learning grammar. Okay. Now I have to warn you guys. The next slide is a little offensive. All right. This was Tyson's idea. Well. <laughs> You found the slide, and I just proved it. I did find it. <laughs> proved it. Okay, so I apologize in advance if anybody finds this next slide a little on the rude side, but there you go. Here we go. Okay, so the deductive approach. This is a, a, a nice little uh, illustration of how rules are given and then applied to different examples. <laughs> okay, so clearly we have a rule. We have things that don't follow the rule, and then we expect people to go ahead and do exactly what the rule states. So this approach to language can actually be very useful, uh, especially for lower levels. Um, the pros for this approach are it's very direct, no nonsense, efficient. Uh, it, it respects to a certain extent students' intelligence and ability to just absorb these grammar rules and they're happy to kind of practice them often in a restricted or controlled way after the initial presentation. Um, the cons, however, um, which I think really emerge pretty much at pre-intermediate, definitely at intermediate level and above, is that this type of teaching where the teacher stands up and says, today we're going to be looking at past simple versus past continuous. Maybe there's a couple of uh, sentences on the board, but they go into how we create it, what the form is, what the meaning is, and then there's usually some drills. So that then obviously some other stuff that goes on with the PPP style after that would be maybe some more freer practice. But this type of teaching or this type of framework can be seen as very dull, a bit over technical, can be very demotivating for students. And the reason I think it can be very demotivating is because it assumes no knowledge. When a teacher teaches in the deductive approach, they are assuming that the students know very little about the language and therefore need to be told. Now, at beginner and elementary level, chances are that's not a bad assumption to make. However, at other higher levels, when students have absorbed some knowledge of the grammar, they have some information on the form, then it, it really uh, it does not acknowledge the fact that they don't want to look at an area of grammar right from the basics, right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, now the other thing with this uh, PPP or deductive approach to teaching is it's easier on the teacher as well, which I think is why it makes it continuing to be popular really in a lot of course books. Um, it, this is kind of the main way. So here's some sentences. Let's look at this. Do some restricted practice. Bob's your uncle. That's, that's kind of how it works. The other thing as well, another reason why we're also familiar with this approach is it's also the easiest framework to teach on a teacher training course. The teacher has a lot of control. 
there's not a big scope for students to ask a lot of awkward questions. And it allows the teacher to do a very kind of limited scope of research. So the night before when they're preparing for the grammar, they don't have to freak out and think about everything there is to think about, which isn't really true even in the other yeah. approaches. <laughs> people, people might get that impression. They have a very small scope to think about, and, uh, and then they just go ahead and do it. Now, the other issue with this, though, is students come to class generally to get something that they can't get from a grammar practice book in the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of what PPP style lessons end up being is very much what they could get in a coffee shop with a grammar practice book. There's not a lot of processing or challenging and things like that. So the alternative to this okay, um, is going to be the inductive approach. But what this slide is showing is as soon as you do get up to the upper intermediate and advanced levels, Students get bored very easily, and one of the things that we often hear as teachers is we've seen it all before. Mm -hmm. I've had, Tyson, you had yeah, a... I had a student, uh, well, several students from Korea. Um, I did live in Korea for a while. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was teaching pre-advanced and advanced levels um, at a private language school downtown for about five years. And I'd switch between doing the grammar part versus doing the listening and speaking class. And... Uh, in the, the pre-advanced, we'd, we'd come across these verb tenses that they had studied many, 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 many times before. And a, a, couple, a couple classes, one in particular, I remember a couple of students from Korea saying to me, oh, I don't want to learn this present perfect. You know, I've learned it ten times before. I know it inside out, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. And I, after I had um, gone through the lesson with them, I tried to make it clear to them that, you know, just because you've done it before it doesn't mean you know all of the ways to do it. And Absolutely. the higher up in the levels you go, you may study something that you have studied before in principle, but uh, it's a different way that people use it in language, that maybe a rarer way, but it's a different way mm -hmm. anyhow. And I yeah. had the students suddenly have this light bulb go over their head and, and say, oh my gosh, like I, I totally understand now that I'm, I shouldn't, you know, look at grammar classes this whole boring thing that I've already done before because it's going to be something new and it's going to be something to exactly. add to my existing knowledge. And, and I was really happy with that kind yeah. of flash bulb moment. Yeah. Well, I think what students get tripped up on, on, on a lot is thinking, if they think they have some understanding of the title, mm -hmm. i.e. present perfect simple, it activates some you know, passive knowledge that they might have. And they just think that that's it. Oh, okay, well, that's all there is to it. And I do think that, you know, it's our responsibility as teachers to, to kind of reignite a bit of curiosity yeah. about it and also to, you know, make a really clear bridge between grammar and context and usage. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, grammar is simply one of the systems that we have identified as a way of trying to understand patterns and rules of speech. But we don't, grammar doesn't trump everything. It's just kind of the most easily understandable feature. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, I've never phoned my mom to practice future forms, for example, or talk to my sister to practice the past simple. I mean, you might, Tyson. Well, I've never, I've never talked to my mom <laughs> to practice them, but we've certainly had grammar discussions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so the other issue as well is establishing what I think is a key, key, key issue, and that's the need to know. As students, as, as students, as soon as students, there we go, as soon as students feel that they need to know something, they're so much more engaged with, with finding out what that actually is. So instead of spoon feeding them, lead them down the path a little bit. Make them curious. Get them engaged. Where's the surprise? Things like that. Okay, so the alternative to the deductive approach is the inductive approach. And so this is a little statue of Sherlock Holmes, which I thought would be quite a good symbol for the inductive approach. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, working out rules on the basis of examples. So in the inductive approach, you're looking much more at problem solving, processing, discovering, and a lot of critical thinking skills can come in here as well. There's consciousness raising, increased mental effort because students aren't just kind of passively going yada, yada, yada. They actually have to try and figure something out about the grammar on their own. 